I am back again. So welcome to the next talk. This is quite a good one. I love, I love a bit of blockchain. So we are joined by two fabulous speakers who will be splitting the time talking about blockchain, first of all, for a better world. So Danning, please do reveal your camera and mic. Oh, wonderful. Love it. The tech track has been running really smoothly, everyone. Let's not tell the others <laughs> how good we are in this particular room. Yes, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Ashanti. Let me just find my speaker. Right. Since the invention in 2008, blockchain has been used for various use cases in the world. The technology is still considered in its infancy and it has a number of challenges to overcome. However, its advantages have started to shine through. Hi, I'm Yaning Yudono. I'm an engineer at BCG Digital Ventures. Humanitarian efforts have been close to my heart. And as an engineer, I've been interested in blockchain technology recently. Today, I'm going to talk about the intersection of the two and how blockchain applications have helped raise marginalized communities and many other vulnerable people across the world. However much we hate wars, they still do happen. Millions of people flee from them and some end up in refugee camps. This is a picture of Zaatari camp in Jordan, housed to tens of thousands of Syrian refugees. The United Nations World Food Program has been involved with delivering food aid in this camp. In order to deliver the food aid efficiently, World Food Program built a system called Building Blocks. The process for refugees to get food is, first and foremost, they need to register with the United Nations of High, High Commissioners of Refugees, or UNHCR, where they get their biometrics taken, including their iris data and their fingerprints data. And then a virtual wallet is created with $30 entitlement. Once the refugees got virtual wallet with the entitlement, they can go to the shops inside the camp, buy food and other necessities. And at the checkout, they can scan their biometrics. Afterwards, transaction is then recorded in the blockchain and WFP reimburses the retailer on a regular basis. Building blocks have been supporting more than 100,000 refugees in Jordan and it's been supporting more than 500,000 refugees in Bangladesh. It's one of the largest scale of blockchain implementation for humanitarian effort, if not the largest. Now let's look at the blockchain technology that building blocks use. Let's look at the proof of concept stage in Pakistan. When they went for public blockchain network, they used the Ethereum network that time. And uh, that network uses proof of work algorithm. And the way it works is the building blocks send the transactions data to the network. And the transactions data are then stored in a pool of pending transactions, the little cloud there on the far left and miners or special node or computer in the blockchain network will then pick and choose the transactions from the pool and put them in a block. Once a block is created, it's then broadcasted to all of the nodes in the network. And once all of the nodes in the network agree that this block is valid, then the block can be added to the blockchain ledger. Once a block has been added to the ledger, it cannot be changed and it cannot be removed. The way proof of work algorithm works is similar to the way all you can eat buffet works. So you go to the all you can eat buffet, there's a big table there with lots of dishes there, and you can pick and choose the food that you would like to put on your plate. Some of the food can go quicker than other food. Some of the food can just stay forever on the table and no one ever want them. The same thing happened to the transactions in the pro proof of work algorithm. Some of the transactions can go very quickly and get added to the ledger. And some of the transactions can stay a bit longer in the pool or they can stay forever and no miners ever pick them up. On an average day, it takes anywhere between 15 seconds and five to 10 minutes to process a transaction. And for this case, the building's block case is just too slow. We don't want refugees to stay at the checkout in the shop in the camp for 10 minutes. This system is just too slow. Therefore, from pilot phase onwards, 
WFP went for a private blockchain network solution, and they use Parity Ethereum for that. This network uses proof of authority algorithm. This algorithm works similar to proof of work algorithm with some differences. The building blocks still send the transactions data into the private network. The transactions data is then put into the a queue of pending transactions. So it's not a pool anymore, it's a queue. And a proposal, which is a special node or computer in the network, uh, process the transactions based on the order that they came. First in, first out. The transactions are then put in the block and the block is then broadcasted to all of the nodes in the network. In this private network, all of the nodes are trusted and authorized. Each of the nodes know each other. For building blocks network, some of the nodes are owned by World Food Program and some of them are owned by United Nations Women. Now, once all of the nodes agree that this block is valid, then the block can be added to the blockchain ledger. And once data is added to the blockchain ledger, it cannot be changed and it cannot be removed. The way proof of, of authority algorithm works, it's not very easy to say, um, is similar to supermarket sale. So we put the items on the conveyor belt and the checkout staff will process the item one by one according to the order that they came. And this process is much faster than the proof of work process. And it finally meets the, trans it finally meets the transaction throughput that the WFE requires. Let's look at the values of blockchain for the refugees. Firstly, the system is optimized. The refugees don't need to go to banks and open bank accounts and do all of the paperwork and administrative tasks. All they need to do is go to the shop, buy food or soap or other necessities, go to the checkout and scan the biometrics. The system meets the refugees where they are. Secondly, because it's built on, building, uh, because it's built on blockchain, Sorry. It can be used by other humanitarian agencies as well. Building Blocks is currently used by World Food Program for delivering the food aid and the United Nations Women for the Cash Work Program, which is a program to empower women to earn a living and gain economic independence. Thirdly, it respects the privacy of the refugees. The shops don't really need to know the refugees' name or where they're from or how old they are. You know, all the information that are usually on the ID card or passport, they don't need to know that. All they need to know is that there is, this refugees has in, have enough balance in their wallet and can pay for the food. And no personally identified information of refugees stored in the blockchain. Only encrypted ID is stored there. Now we've seen how blockchain help refugees. Let's look at marginalized communities, especially, especially those living in illegal settlements and slums in Kenya. This is a picture of one of those, it's called Mukuru. Villages like this really depend on day laborers to go out of the village and do their work and then earn Kenyan shillings and bring the Kenyan shillings back to the village. However, day labor really depends on seasonalities. It depends on crop yield. And lately, since COVID hit, a lot of these laborers lost their jobs. And that's very unfortunate because these people have goods and services to trade. They can sell eggs, they can sell beans, they can style people's hair, they can repair people's roof. But there's just not enough Kenyan shillings to support the local economy to run. And that's just so frustrating. Now let's look at a project that's been working on alleviating this problem. It's called Community Inclusion Currencies by Grassroots Economics. And the way it works is, firstly, a reserve needs to be funded, either through donation from Red Cross, for example, or through investment by local government. And then a community needs to commit to back the currency using the, their goods and services. Once there's a reserve and there's a community, then the local currencies can be created and distribute it to the community members. They can then use the local currency to trade within the village. The local currency can only work inside the village. It doesn't work outside of the village. And therefore, it boosts the local economy. It increases the jobs and business developments, and it leads to sustainable livelihood. Community inclusion currencies have been used by more than 39,000 villagers across 74 villages. 
More than 267,000 transactions have been made on this system. More than 147,000 US dollar worth of local currencies have been distributed, which have supported more than 1.5 million US dollar worth of local trades. Community inclusion currencies have also contributed in the increase of jobs creation, food security, school attendance, and environmental activities, as well as the decrease of crime and corruption. Let's look at the blockchain technology that the community inclusion currencies use. Similar to what World Food Program found, grassroots economics also found that the public blockchain network is too slow for them. Not only it is too slow for them, it's also too expensive. Now let's look at the pool of pending transactions again, the little card on the far left, and the miners. The miners usually pick and choose the transactions that have high transaction fees. Transaction fees are the fees that the user of blockchains are willing to pay for the transactions to be added to the ledger. And this fee is paid to the miners. So if the if they are not willing to pay a higher fee, the transaction usually stay in the pool for a long time or not picked up at all. Therefore, the public network is too slow and too expensive. However, grassroots economics don't have as much budget as a World Food Program. And that's why they didn't go for the private blockchain network solution, because it can be expensive to create and manage the kind of network. Fortunately, there are many solutions out there. And one of them is the sidechain network. Community inclusion currencies, <coughs> excuse me, uses a sidechain network called XDAI, <coughs> called XDAI. And XDAI uses proof of authority algorithm. This is a similar algorithm to what WFP used for the private blockchain network. Sidechain network works on top of public blockchain network with a bridge for the communication between these two layers. This is an established network. The infrastructure is already there, and this is a layered solution, with the first layer being the public network, and the second layer is the sidechain network. The grassroots economics didn't really have to build any network from scratch. They can use this network by sending the transaction data and interact with the sidechain network um, uh, straight away. We can think of this as living in a three-story building. And on the ground floor, there's all-you-can-eat buffet, and it's slow, and it's expensive. On the first floor, there's supermarket, and it's fast, and it's cheap. And on the second floor, there's community inclusion currencies who interact with their downstairs neighbor in the supermarket very frequently. So what are the values of blockchains for the marginalized communities? Firstly, the exchangeability. One local currency equals one Kenyan shillings, and they can be exchanged both ways. Secondly, it's transparent. All of the transactions made on the system can be viewed publicly. Feel free to go to dashboard.sarafu.network, where you can see the stats of all the transactions. And if you follow the links, you can even see the individual transactions made on the system. Thirdly, it's accessible. These villages don't usually have banks or ATMs, and villagers usually need to go to the town to visit banks or ATMs. But for this system, it's accessible from inside the village, as long as people have mobile phones that can send and receive SMS. They don't even need smartphones for this. We've seen how blockchain has benefited refugees and marginalized communities. There are many more amazing initiatives out there of blockchain. And um, yeah, they are either in pilot phase, proof of concept of white, white papers phase. And they have, uh, yes, blockchain is not the answer for all of the problems in the world, but there are a lot of, um, a lot of pilots and proof of concepts to try and see if blockchain can benefit vulnerable people in the world. Some of, some of these organizations have faced challenges with the blockchain technology. They found that blockchain technologies can be slow, it can be too expensive, and it can be simply too complex. However, there are a lot of work out there uh, has been done, or currently ongoing, the academic research, technical innovation, legal frameworks to make sure that it's used ethically. 
uh, to make sure that blockchain technology can be fast, cheap, and simple to use. So let's use blockchain for the better world. My name is Diani Yudono, and I thank you very much for your time. Um, I guess I can answer some questions. Let me just look at the Q&A session. Yeah, sorry, I talk very, very quickly because I've only got 15 minutes. I'm happy to share my deck uh, if you're interested. All right, let me see if there's any questions. I don't see any questions so far. Maybe Ashanti can help me with how I can uh, distribute my deck later on. Or if you tweet me on, uh, yeah, on the Twitter, my handle is Galimelon, and then you can ask for the deck as well, and I can send it to you. 